Today on America's Desk Kitchen, Julia wows Bridget with the perfect pan-seared salmon. Jack challenges Bridget to an intense sip fest of fish sauce. Dan dives into the science of salmon. And Elle shows Julia the secrets to foolproof shrimp scampi. Right here on America's Test Kitchen. We can't keep up with salmon. It's overworked, overcooked, and overexposed. This fish is out of control and getting into trouble, appearing in <laughs> recipes like enchiladas and pizza. But today, we're giving salmon the intervention it needs. Mm -hmm. We're bringing it back home with a great pan-seared salmon recipe. And searing a piece of salmon sounds pretty straightforward, but there are two big issues. One, when you think about salmon, the ends are about half as thick as the very center. That means these overcook quite quickly. The other thing is, it cooks so fast, it's hard to know exactly when it's done. So we solve both of those problems today. So starting with this nice piece of salmon. Now you can buy individual fillets if you like, and sometimes that's how they're prepped at the seafood counter. But if you can buy this center cut piece and cut it yourself, you'll ensure that each of these pieces is exactly the same thickness, so they cook at the same rate. So this is a one and a half pound piece of center cut salmon. And to make individual fillets, we're simply gonna slice it crosswise into four pieces. Now, I want to point out that the skin is still on the salmon, and that's very important for this recipe. Now, to solve that uneven cooking on the salmon, the solution is easy. We're going to brine. And here I have two quarts of water, and I'm going to add half a cup of kosher salt. We're just going to dissolve this right into the water. All right, there we go. Now, these pieces of salmon are pretty small, so we're just going to soak the salmon in the brine for about 15 minutes. You don't even have to put it in the fridge. You can just leave it right on the counter. Convenient. So mm -hmm. the solution was making a solution. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm just going to put this lid on, and we'll be back in 15. All right. All right, so the salmon is out of the brine. I've patted it dry, and it's time to get cooking. So here I have a 12-inch nonstick skillet. And it's not on the heat yet, it's a cold pan. I was gonna ask if you need me to turn on the heat. <laughs> nope, we're gonna start with a cold pan and that's the important part of this recipe. So here I'm gonna add half a teaspoon of salt and half a teaspoon of pepper to the cold pan. I know, this is kind of unusual, isn't it? I don't think I've ever started any other recipe this way. I'm looking at you like you have two heads right uh -huh. now. Uh-huh. All right, so now we're gonna add the salmon to the cold pan tell you, once you know how to cook salmon this way, it's a game changer. I feel the need as soon as you put that salmon in the pan to make sizzle noises. <laughs> <laughs> Just doesn't feel right. All right, so there we go. We have the salt and pepper in the pan, and we have the salmon sitting on top. Now we're going to put it over the heat, and this is what's happening. That gentle heat is going to cook the fish slowly, and that's good because it will help prevent the thin side from overcooking. It's also going to render that natural fat out of the salmon, so you don't need to add any extra fat to the pan. And that low, slow start means you're not going to overcook the fish. You have more time to get it right. All right, now I'm going to season the top of the fish with a little more salt and pepper. This is a quarter teaspoon of salt and a quarter teaspoon of pepper. And now we're going to take the skillet, <laughs> take it out in the sunshine so it can cook very slowly, right? <laughs> Close. <laughs> now we're going to put this skillet over medium-high heat. This is going to cook for about six to eight minutes, and what you're going to see is the fat's going to start to come out of the salmon, and in the bottom quarter inch of the fish, you're going to see that it's cooked. Hmm. And again, how long is that going to take? Six to eight minutes. Well, it's a clever trick if it works, and we shall see. All right, it's been about six minutes, and you can see the fat starting to come out of the salmon. And these aren't going to stick to the pan because we sprinkled the pan with the salt and pepper before we put the salmon in. That makes sort of a ball bearings underneath the salmon so it doesn't stick. You non-sticked the non-stick <laughs> pan. <laughs> I did. All right, so we're going to keep it over medium-high heat another six to eight minutes. We're looking for the salmon to cook through and register about 125 degrees. All right, so the salmon has been cooking on the flesh side for about six minutes. And now we're just going to take its temperature. Again, we're looking for an internal temperature of 125. There we go, on the mark. So it's time to take the salmon out of the pan. Oh, ho, ho, ho. I have to say though, mm. those are the most evenly colored salmon I've ever seen. So usually when they hit the pan, that flesh side down, they buckle and you only get a little patch of browning, but those are brown from edge to edge. Mm -hmm. They're gorgeous. All right, so we're gonna make a quick mango salsa. Here I have a nice ripe mango. And I'm just going to prep it quickly by trimming off the top and the bottom. And then I like to peel it with a knife. All right, so now that I've sliced off all the skin, I'm going to slice down along either side of the pit. 
There's more flesh on the sides. I like to slice that off too. Mm. And then this, that's what I call kitchen snack. I'm gonna save that for later. It's even better if you put it in the freezer and then snack on it later. Ooh, mm -hmm. good call. <laughs> so I'm gonna start by cutting the mango down into quarter inch thick planks. Then I'm gonna slice the planks lengthwise into little sticks. And then we're gonna slice it crosswise into a nice dice. All right, so that's our mango. Now we're gonna add just a little bit of spice. So I'm gonna add a fresh jalapeno. I'm gonna mince this pretty finely and I'm not gonna include the seeds because that's gonna be too much heat for us. Now also, if you're really sensitive to jalapeno and the capsaicin in it, it can make things pretty burny if you touch your eyes or your face. I'm used to it, so I don't need to wear a glove. But if you're a little sensitive, a pair of gloves when handling hot chilies is not a bad idea. All right, to finish out our salsa, we're gonna add a little bit of shallot. This is one small shallot. A little bit of lime juice. This is three tablespoons. Now of, it's a party. Now it's a party. <laughs> and this is two tablespoons of freshly chopped mint. Now we're gonna add a tablespoon extra virgin olive oil. One garlic clove that's been minced. Last but not least, a little salt. This is half a teaspoon of salt. I'm just gonna stir this up. Such pretty colors with the mint and the mango together. And you don't need to let this sit? No, it doesn't need to sit. You can use it right away. Just gonna put a little bit, oh. oh. Yeah, a little bit of color. There you go. Beautiful, beautiful. This is top of the line restaurant fare right here. This mm -hmm. is beautiful. Mm. That's good salmon. That was the moistest, thin part of a salmon filet <laughs> I've ever had. Mm. Look how moist that is. Mm -hmm. It's almost buttery. Actually. Yeah. And the other thing is, to get that perfectly cooked salmon, you don't need to jump through hoops. You just need to start it in a cold pan. Who Love thought? that. It works. It works. It works. So for salmon with a crisp crust and a juicy interior, the key is doing less, not more. After brining, cook the salmon skin side down on some seasonings and get this, in a cold pan. Let the fat render out, flip to cook through, and then top it off with a quick, easy salsa. And there you have it. From our test kitchen to your kitchen, a simple yet spectacular recipe for pan-seared salmon. A tiny amount of fish sauce can add salty, savory, complex flavor to pad thais and stir fries. And Jack is here to school us on which fish sauce is best. I guess you never thought you'd be attending this school. No, no, I can't say that I'm too happy to be here at the moment either. <laughs> so there are two approaches to this. When we did the large tasting panel, there were people who were literally holding their nose. I brought you a clothespin in case you wanted uh, a physical assistance on holding your nose. But the real secret here is to embrace the challenge. Okay, all right. And, and to just go with it. So Diving in. Dive in, so fish sauce, it is basically fermented anchovies. They take whole anchovies, they salt them, they put them in a vat for 12 months, and you can do it. I know you can do it. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> we think of this as an Asian condiment. Of course, it's essential in Vietnamese, Thai cooking, but actually the Romans <laughs> used fish sauce 2,000 years ago. Really? It adds umami flavor to anything. What you're looking for is saltiness and fishiness, but also some other notes. As with soy sauce, where you're looking for nuance and complexity, our tasters felt like the fish sauces that brought more than just fish and salt were more interesting. We sent these all out to the lab and we figured out what makes a great fish sauce. More protein. The winner has two to three times the amount of protein, which means it has more fish in it. So you seem to be surviving okay. You've gotten over the initial hurdle here. Yeah, at first it was like I had just dove into a really unclean aquarium. But as I go, I'm definitely starting to pick up different notes yeah. beyond salt and fish. Right, they're all salty. They're supposed to be salty. They're not supposed to be something you savor in a shot glass. <laughs> <laughs> we made dipping sauces, we cooked with them, but this is of course the easiest way to really see the differences. And there really are significant differences among the five brands that we sampled. So as you're tasting them, are you noticing anything about the aroma that is different? Because at first they all smell funky and fishy, but then you do get some different notes. You get some smoke, you can get even some fruit from some of them. Let me give them, let me give them a whiff. See, now I thought this was gonna be a one and done. You, you did. Yeah, that you were gonna have a sip of each one. I think there was a shock thing that came over me and I'm coming out of my shock. Okay. This one is a little bit like low tide. And cheese. 
Good or bad? Not great. This one, there's almost a tobacco-y aroma to this in a good way. Pipe tobacco, not cigarette tobacco. This one also has a little bit of a cheese thing too, but it's like a Parmesan rind. Okay. It's got that same glutamate, that savory flavor to it. But I think I like this one the best. All right. This one seems saltier than this one. This one seems the least salty to me. Why don't you turn All that right. over? That is our winner. This is Red Boat. It is the saltiest, but also has the most protein. So it doesn't taste salty because there's so much protein in it. Our taster thought it was the most complex. Mm -hmm. You agreed with them. It is a great fish sauce. And now, there's a lot more than just salt and fish going on there. Yeah. Now, did you have a second choice here? I'd say probably this one. And our tasting panel agreed. This oh, was good. the runner-up, Thai Kitchen. Excellent. It was good, but it wasn't quite as great as the winner. And this was the, at the bottom of the rankings. This was slow time. Yeah. <laughs> you kind of nailed it. Thank you, Jack. Well, if you'd like to try the winner of our fish sauce tasting, it's Red Boat 40 in fish sauce, $7.99 a bottle. When you want a perfect medium rare steak, you get out your digital thermometer and you nail 125 degrees right in the center. And yet, when it comes to cooking fish, you skip the thermometer altogether. And that's really too bad because precision is even more important when you're cooking fish. Even fatty fish, like salmon, can go from tender and moist to chalky and dry in a flash. In the test kitchen, we've always preferred to cook salmon to 125 degrees for that ideal balance of firm yet silky flesh. But the majority of salmon we cook is farmed. We noticed that when we cook some wild species to that temp, we found them to be really dry. So we decided to take a closer look. To find out what was going on, we tested fillets of the four most common wild species of salmon, along with farm salmon. We'd cook samples of each to both 120 degrees and 125 degrees. And then we asked tasters who didn't know what we were doing with the test to pick which sample had the best texture. Every single taster liked the wild cooked to 120 and the farm salmon at 125. Now these results might sound surprising. After all, salmon is salmon, right? Well, not exactly. Farm salmon live a relatively sedentary life. You can think of them as the couch potato of the ocean. Whereas wild salmon are active hunters and they swim upstream to spawn. And those lifestyle differences make a real difference on the plate. It turns out that farm salmon differs in two important ways from the wild varieties. For one, the collagen protein in farm salmon contains fewer chemical crosslinks. Less crosslinks means weaker collagen and softer flesh. And second, farm salmon contains more fat than any wild variety and up to four times as much fat as the leanest species. We all know that fat makes food taste juicy. So with naturally firmer flesh and less fat to provide lubrication, wild salmon can have the texture of overcooked fish even at 125 degrees. By cooking wild salmon to just 120, the muscle fibers contract less and they stay moist and tender. For perfect salmon every time, cooked farm salmon to 125 degrees and cooked wild to just 120. Today, we're not sauteing any shrimp, which is a pretty remarkable statement when you consider that we're about to make shrimp scampi. Because if you look up this recipe in nearly any cookbook, you'll find the same set of instructions. Saute some shrimp, then make a quick garlic and butter sauce. But that will net you this, which is overcooked shrimp, a broken sauce that's greasy on top and has an overpowering garlic flavor. But today, Ella's gonna show us a better way to make this classic dish. Yes, we made 50 pounds of shrimp. You cooked 50 pounds of shrimp to yes. get this recipe right. Until we got it right. Are you crazy? A little, <laughs> a little. First of all, we have to start with the right kind of shrimp. We have here one and a half pound of shrimp, and this is enough to feed about four people. We use jumbo shrimp. The big guys. The big guys, mostly because it's less shrimp to peel. We're gonna start from the bottom here on the swimming legs. Mm -hmm. And it's always better to start peeling from the bottom to the top. That's how we reach success. Always <laughs> starting from the bottom, right? Okay. So we're saving these shells too, by the way. Yeah, I noticed that. So it's always best to make sure that when you're buying shrimp, that you buy shrimp that is not treated with added salt or preservatives. That's very important. We've reached my favorite part of this recipe. All right. It's what I call the three, two, one step. So we're gonna brine the shrimp in three tablespoons salt, two tablespoons sugar, into one quart of water. <laughs> three, two, one. So I'm gonna whisk just to dissolve. And so this brine is going to preserve the flavor of the shrimp, and the sugar in it is gonna add to the shrimp's natural sweetness. Okay. Yeah. 
So I'm going to add this shrimp in here. Now, do we have to brine the shrimp for a long time? No, not at all. We're only going to brine it for about 15 minutes in the fridge, covered. Julie, our shrimp is out of the brine. Look at that. We're going to just give it a few pats to dry it off. I'm going to set it aside. We've also started one tablespoon of oil in our pan on high heat, just so the oil is simmering. We're going to use our shrimp shells to create a stock. We're doing this because shrimp itself, cooked in such a short time, does not lend a lot of flavor to the dish. So we're going to create that flavor. We want the shrimp shells to start spotting a little. We see some white spots. We oh, see yeah. some brown spots happening there. When you start to see that happening prominently in the pan, we know we're ready to move on to the next step. OK, I see it's predominantly brown in that pan. So we're going to remove it from the heat. And we're going to start to create the base for our stock. We have one cup of white wine here. And add four sprigs of thyme. And now I see why you did that off the heat. So you didn't yes. catch fire in the whole skillet. Absolutely. I like my eyelashes. <laughs> All right, Julie, we're going to return this to the heat. And we're going to turn it back on so it can simmer. So we've tested this shrimp stock at five minutes and up to 30 minutes. And we found that five minutes is all the time that we need to get these shrimp shells to give us all the flavor they have. The fact that you only need to simmer the shrimp stock for five minutes is pretty interesting when you consider that other types of stocks, take chicken stock for example, require hours of simmering time in order to extract all the flavor from the bones. Now the reason for this is because of their flavor compounds. The flavors in chicken broth are stable. They're not going to go anywhere during that long cooking time. The flavor compounds in shrimp, however, are volatile, and they're eager to escape out of the pan. So limiting the simmering time in the shrimp stock to just five minutes means that more of the shrimp flavor stays in the pan. Julia, it's been five minutes. It's time for us to pour our stock out. We're going to strain it here. Oh, and I'm going to press these shells, because we got liquid gold in there. Mm, that is liquid gold, that isn't that it? Out. It all really it. has a very strong shrimp aroma. All right, so the next step to building the base of our scampi sauce is starting with my favorite ingredient, garlic. Oh, mine too. I'm going to slice this garlic because minced garlic has a tendency to give our sauce a gritty taste. Mm -hmm. Slicing is more mild because it creates less surface area exposed. So you can control the flavor of your garlic with your knife. So that looks like a lot of garlic. Now, how much garlic is that? It is a lot of garlic. It's actually eight cloves of garlic. But because we're slicing instead of mincing, it gives us an opportunity to bump up that garlic flavor. OK, so I'm going to wipe out the skillet. I'm not taking it all away, but just the muckety muck. We're going to heat one tablespoon of oil over medium high heat. We know the pan is ready when the oil starts to shimmer. Let's go in with our eight cloves of garlic. Oh, that is one of my all-time favorite smells, when the garlic just hits the pan and you get that initial waft. Oh, yeah. So we're going to add half a teaspoon of red pepper flakes and a quarter teaspoon of black pepper. Mmm, a little heat. A little heat. So I'm just going to give this a little stir to make sure that all the cloves are covered in oil, three to five minutes, and until the garlic starts to brown around the edges. All right, Julia, this is our liquid gold, mm -hmm. our shrimp stock. So just so you know, that was about two-thirds cup of stock we produced there. That smells amazing. You know, the smell is getting better and better because before it was a nice, simple shrimp aroma. Now it's garlic and shrimp and a little bit of spice. So we're going to go in with our shrimp. And this is poaching. You know, as we decided we weren't sauteing, we're going to poach this shrimp because it's going to retain the moisture in the shrimp, and we're going to get all the flavors from this great stock we made. Now, this is kind of a big deal, because as I mentioned earlier, you look up any recipe for shrimp scampi, and it's just sauteed, which turns them dry and rubbery. But by poaching the shrimp, you're actually keeping them moist so they'll have some good texture. We have shrimp control. <laughs> the shrimp are under control. All right, so we're going to cook this shrimp for about five minutes. We're going to cover it with the lid so that they cook in unison. And we'll come back and visit it and stir it a couple of times. <laughs> Julia, I believe our shrimp is ready. Ooh. But how can we tell? <laughs> the first thing is to check your shrimp and see if it's opaque. Once it's opaque in color, we know we're ready. I'm going to remove the shrimp from the pan. We're going to start our scampi sauce. <laughs> we want the sauce to be silky and emulsified. So we're going to do that by adding three tablespoons of lemon juice to a mere teaspoon of cornstarch. Now, we've tested flour, we tested pectin, we tested gelatin, and we found that just this one teaspoon of cornstarch with this lemon juice 
works like magic. So we're gonna return our sauce to a medium heat. We're gonna add our binder. We're gonna let this cook for about a minute and during that time, we should start to see the sauce thickening. So we've taken this pan off the heat and we're gonna add four tablespoons of cold butter. Mm, I was wondering when the butter was gonna come into the sauce. Oh yeah, we're gonna whisk that in and we're also gonna add a tablespoon of chopped parsley. And thanks to that cornstarch, the butter in the sauce is gonna stay nicely emulsified and not separate out into that greasy layer. That sauce went from looking fairly terrible to pretty terrific in about a minute. We're ready to add the shrimp. Oh, that looks amazing. It's not your everyday shrimp scampi here. Mm -hmm. Now you're gonna make me wait any longer or can we taste this? No, I think we can taste oh, it. Oh, good. So do you want a lot of shrimp or a little bit of shrimp? Uh, what do you think? <laughs> I'll give you a lot I mean, of shrimp. I mean, what are you gonna have? I'm gonna have a lot of shrimp. <laughs> and do not be shy with the sauce. I will not at all. So I'm gonna finish this off with a nice bright mm. spray of lemon. If it tastes as good as it looks, we're home. Mmm, mmm. Oh boy. These shrimp are so tender. They're not at all rubbery. In fact, they almost have a silky consistency. Well, we had a lot of shrimp control, so I think we <laughs> can pat ourselves on the back for that. And that sauce has layers of flavor with the shrimp, a little kick at the end, and that smooth garlic flavor that's not at all gritty. Not at all, and it's not over oily, you mm -hmm. know? Just nice and evenly balanced. For the ultimate shrimp scampi, we used one and a half pounds of untreated jumbo shrimp and we didn't saute them. Instead, we sauteed their shells before making a quick five minute shrimp broth. And to bring that harsh garlic flavor under control, we sliced, not minced the cloves, and sauteed them along with a few other aromatics before building the sauce. Finally, we poached the shrimp right in the sauce so that they cooked through evenly and took on a tender, supple texture. There you have it, from the test kitchen to your kitchen, the ultimate recipe for shrimp scampi. You can get this recipe, all the recipes from the season, along with our tasting, testings, and selected episodes at our website, americastestkitchen.com. Thanks for watching America's Test Kitchen. What'd you think? Well, leave a comment and let us know which recipes you're excited to make, or you can just say hello. You can find links to today's recipes and reviews in the video description. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel. See you later. I'll see you later.